Excellent job. Thank you to Lara this morning, for Julie and all of her planning, for Katie for playing, Ron as liturgists, all those folks back there who make uh, things happen. Uh, there's so many people who contribute to the worship of our church, and I'm thankful for that. Would you uh, join your hearts and minds with mine in a time of uh, prayer for hearing God's word this morning? Oh Lord, this is one of those beautiful winter mornings when the sun shines so brightly and reflects and gleams off the fallen snow. And we are reminded of the blessing of light. And Lord, we ask you this morning that you would cast abroad in our hearts and in front of ourselves and our paths the light of your word, that we would know how to walk in your ways and live to your glory, that perhaps even by your filling us in our lives with your word and your presence, we might actually become, as you've called us to be, the light of the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this morning is Daniel chapter 3 and verses 13 through 18. From that, Jay is giving you a good sense of the overall overarching story. And uh, we pick up here a bit in the middle of that story at verse 13, Daniel 3, 13 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. The title of the sermon, by the way, is The God Who Delivers. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire music ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. This is the word of the Lord. Amen to that. A woman who uh, lived next door to a preacher was puzzled by his personality change in the pulpit. At home, he was a rather shy and quiet, retiring type of person. But at church, in the pulpit, he was a real fire and brimstone preacher, an orator, rousing the masses in the name of God. It was as if he was two different people. And so one day she asked him about the dramatic transformation that came over him when he preached. And he said to her, ah, oh, that's my alter ego. Get it? Alter ego? A-L-T-A-R? That's a basically a dad joke, right? I love dad jokes. It's, I feel like it's one of the few privileges I have left in my age and in my station in life. I can do dad jokes. It's mine. I send my daughter, you know, she's off at college, so every day I'll send her a dad joke. I usually get a face palm emoji back, to, you know, from her. Yesterday I sent her the one, uh, I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know. It's good, right? This morning, I sent this one. I told my wife to embrace her mistakes. She hugged me. <laughs> Dad jokes, they're great, right? That preacher joke, that was basically a horrible dead joke of a sort, it, it plays off of a trope, right? The, the trope of the fire and brimstone preacher. The preacher that preaches about hell and hellfire and things like that, it's one that we're familiar with, right? It gets kind of parodied on television. You, know, you get that southern accent and the preaching of the hellfire. 
And it's kind of ingrained in our culture. Perhaps the most well-known sermon in American history is what sermon? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Right. Jonathan Edwards. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. That's fire and brimstone preaching, right? And that kind of preaching has kind of fallen out of favor. People don't do that anymore. It's not really culturally acceptable or invited. And I would throw myself into the, into the class of people who have perhaps neglected that age-old trope of preaching. And there are a lot of reasons why that has happened culturally. But I wonder sometimes in all of our sophistication whether we have lost something, lost an important warning, an important truth about who God is, because the scriptures do describe God as a consuming fire. It's as if God is like a, you know, if I can make this analogy, like a, like a pack of cigarettes, right, with that Surgeon General's warning, this may be hazardous to your health. God is dangerous. Right? He's a consuming fire and idolatry, particularly in the scriptures, is listed as something that is hazardous to our health. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, when the Israelites were about to enter into the promised land, the book of Deuteronomy is basically the ground rules, the, the book, the covenant that is required to retain possession of that land. And, and at the top of those ground rules for being in the land and staying in the land and living well in the land is the call by God to the people of Israel to avoid idolatry. This is what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 4, 23 and 24. So be careful not to forget the covenant that the Lord your God made with you and not to make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. And then it closes for the Lord your God is a devouring fire, a jealous God. This morning in our text in Daniel chapter 3, we deal with similar themes as those that are found in Deuteronomy 4. Themes of idolatry and fire. Except here in Daniel 3, we kind of get a mirror image, an inverse of what's going on there in Deuteronomy 4. For in Daniel 3, we do not deal with those who are devoured by fire for their idolatry, but rather with those who are delivered from fire for their refusal to engage in idolatry. Now here's the big idea I want you to grasp this morning. A big idea I can put in one sentence. It's very simple. What I want you to see this morning is that God delivers those who worship him. God delivers those who worship him. I want you to see this morning in all of his glory. The God who delivers. And the way we'll do that is the way we've been doing it, through the same methodology. We'll begin by grasping the story, what the scripture, the text says. And we can grasp that story in three simple words as an outline this morning. We can get the whole picture of that story. Those three words, they all begin with an S. This is the outline for the story. We'll look at the statue, the statement, and the salvation. Statue, statement, and salvation. And after we grasp the story in its context, we'll then ask ourselves, what should we learn? What might we learn from this today as 21st century Christians will try to apply that story to our story? So let's begin with that story. We'll begin with the, the statue. We have three words, statue, statement, salvation. We begin with the statue, and that's where the text begins. Verse 1 of Daniel 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Our text starts with a statue, and it's a really big statue. For those of you who are kind of rusty on your transition and conversion from cubits, 
Uh, this thing was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. It was big, impressive. It towered over the people of Babylon. But the statue also towers over the narrative of this text. It casts its long shadow over all of the verses. Ten times you will find that word statue repeated like a drumbeat. The narrator is drawing our attention. This is important. This is a focus. This act of this statue is important. Nebuchadnezzar has revealed himself to be an idol maker. And he's done it big, right? He's done it with style. He's built this massive statue. But he didn't just want to build a statue. Once he had built that statue, he wanted everyone else to join in that idolatry. He wanted to find those who would worship his statue. In fact, he demanded that everyone worship the idol that he had made. And so he throws a big party, right? He throws a big dedication ceremony, and he calls everybody before them, and he calls them to bow down or else. And the or else is described in verse 6 of Daniel 3. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Fire and idolatry. And a clear warning is being given here by Nebuchadnezzar. If you don't do this, it will be hazardous to your health. And so what happened? Well, as Jay mentioned in the sermon, most people, you know, um, kind of went through a quick calculus there and decided, uh, it might be better for me to bow down and worship this thing rather than being thrown into a furnace. I mean, if I look at the alternatives, bowing down a lot easier than burning to death. And so they bowed down, all of them except three righteous dudes. Daniel's three friends. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they decide not to bow down. They refuse to do it, and they stood out, literally, from the crowd. And so someone goes and rats on them to Nebuchadnezzar, telling Nebuchadnezzar, they do not serve your gods, they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. And Nebuchadnezzar is none too pleased with that news, and, but he gives them a second choice, a second chance. He, he calls them and summons them before himself, and he says, all right, you got one more chance. You can bow down to this statue like you're supposed to. Or in verse 15, he says this, but if you do not worship, you shall be immediately thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? And so you get this great moment of tension, of plot tension, of drama in the text. Here they are before the king, an ultimatum given, a second chance to do this. And the spotlight is right on them. And what will they do? Will they bow down? And this leads us to the next word in our story. We've looked at the statue. The second word is the statement. Here's how they respond. They respond by making a statement to the king in front of the king. Verses 16 through 18 of our text. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, let it be known to you, O king. We will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. That's the statement that they made before the king. And it's a rather unequivocal statement, right? There's no doubt about whether they will bow down and worship this statue, right? They say it very clearly, we will not serve your gods. We will not worship the golden statue. So in one sense, it's a statement without equivocation. But if you look a little bit closer, there is some ambiguity, isn't there, in that text? Did you catch it when I read it? Verse 17, if our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us, they have this question, perhaps an ambiguity. It's interesting, there's a translation challenge in this text. And this verse here, verse 17, has been rendered in a variety of different ways, starkly different. Let me just show you briefly, if we could put up that one slide I have here of the text. 
Compare the NRSV here to the NIV. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. Kind of poses as, well, if he's willing and able. Look at the NIV. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. That. It's two different translations, right? You can take that down. Which one of those is right? That's a great question. <laughs> and I don't necessarily know the answer to that question. It is a challenging text to render. And some have said, well, you know, the NIV rendering this kind of more is driven by a conformity to what we expect of faith and of God that, and tradition of translation. You know, well, of course God is able to do that. So I'm kind of inclined to embrace the New Revised Standard Version. I think there's a certain courage in how that's presented, and it doesn't take anything away. We can imagine that this is the reflection of these people in this moment of wondering if God's going to do something. Wendy Witter, in her commentary, writes this. She says, The most straightforward translation of the sentence aligns best with the New Revised Standard Version. And so I think it probably is right. There was some doubt. Now, there's no equivocation, right? The statement is, we won't bow down, we won't worship, no matter what, whether God does anything or not, or if he's able to or not, we're not doing that. But there is also, at the same time, a bit of a struggle in them of wondering what will become of them. And thus we have here again a moment of drama, another point of plot tension, and that is, is God willing to deliver them? Will they be delivered from the furnace? And that brings us to the third word in our story, the salvation. We looked at the statue, the statement, the salvation. And here's what happens when Nebuchadnezzar hears what they say. When they hear this statement, right? He hears this statement from them. He becomes really angry. He gets so angry, he says, I'm turning up the heat on that furnace, seven X, right? Seven times. And that's what he does, right? He turns it up, makes it hotter than ever. And our boys are put into that furnace. And I wonder if they were thinking for a moment, kind of like in a little Alanis Morissette there, in the sense that isn't this ironic? I mean, God tells us, you know, if you participate in idolatry, you're going to get fire. And here we are doing the right thing. And what do we get? Fire. We're in the furnace of fire. And they, they go into that furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar sees something, right? He, he sees this fourth man that Jay talked about. Someone else is in there in the fire. And eventually what happens is the king kind of opens the door and calls them out. And here comes the three guys, right? They come out and they are not singed at all. They don't even smell like fire. There's no odor of smoke around them. They are delivered entirely, not a hair singed on their head. They are delivered, saved from the fire. And then the king responds by worshiping God. He gets it. And he says this, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. And that's how our story ends. That's how the tension of the plot gets resolved. It ends with the salvation of God's faithful people, people who refuse to engage in idolatry, people who refuse to worship other gods. In Daniel 3, God reveals himself as the God who delivers. Delivers those who worship him. So that's the story. We've seen the story, the statue, the statement, the salvation. We've seen the God who delivers. 
Now let's ask ourselves the question, how does that story inform our lives now? What could we learn from that? What might we learn from that? When I do application, by the way, uh, I do that to be provocative, to make us think, to poke, and hopefully poke everybody uh, in a sense, and then uh, comfort and challenge all of us, including me. So let's do some poking. Let's think about how this might work and out in our lives. Let me give you three things, three lessons that we might learn from this text this morning. And the first one is this. First, we learn about the insidiousness of idolatry. The insidiousness of idolatry. This text is about idolatry and fire. It clearly teaches us about the perils of idolatry. In the Institutes of Christian Religion, John Calvin wrote this. He said, quote, We may infer that the human mind is, so to speak, a perpetual forge of idols. That the human mind is a perpetual forge of idols. The Latin makes it sound more ominous that we are idolarum fabricum. That's who we are. We are forgers of idols. I think sometimes when we read this text or we teach it in Sunday school or whatever, we naturally want to identify with Daniel's three friends that this is with whom we're most aligned. But if we're honest about ourselves, the real comparison, the one we're most like in this text, is Nebuchadnezzar, the idol maker, the fabricum idolarum, the forger of idols. We are all at risk of this. And we all do it. And I think one of the challenges, one of the purposes of this text is to challenge us to look at our lives, to look at the idols we are building, erecting in our lives, to ask ourselves, what's my statue? What's your statue? What idol are you fabricating in your mind and in your heart? Now, most of us don't build 90-foot statues in our backyard, right? This is not what we do, except Gary, who's got that Josh Allen statue he's working on. I see you back there. <laughs> but most of us don't build actual physical idols like that anymore. But that does not mean that we are free from fabrication. Tremper Longman, drawing on the work of Paul Tillich, writes about this fabrication of idols, and he uses Tillich's word, the ultimate concern. If you want to find what your statue is, what your idol is, what your risk of idolatry, what you're bowing down to, look for the ultimate concern in your life. He, Longman writes this, he says, Tillich pointed out that a person's God is the thing, is the thing or person that one is most concerned about or affects one's life the most, affects one's life the most. Ultimate concern. Find that person or thing in your life that you're most concerned about, that affects your life the most, and you will find your idol. What is it for you? What is your ultimate concern? What is your God, your idol, the statue you're bowing down to? I think this text drives us and challenges us to ask that question of ourselves. Let me try to give a few possible examples. One is money, right? Money is an easy one to pick on, it's, uh, and it's one I'm uh, acquainted with in my own life. I will acknowledge before you. There have been three times in my life that I have left jobs for less money, including this one. <laughs> So I've done that. I haven't always bowed to the idol of money, but I have. There was one time in my life that I took a job solely because of the money. Now, at the time, I rationalized it in a variety of ways. It's only with hindsight, it's only with perspective that I can really see that they were truly rationalizations. It was an opportunity. It was hard. You know, it made my life a lot easier. And let me tell you, the money was nice. It was helpful. I did good things with it. I didn't squander it. I put it to good use. But while I got the money, 
I got a lot of other stuff too. And it was one of the worst decisions of my life. One that I would change if I could go back and change it, knowing now what I didn't know then. Times in my life, I've bowed down to that statue. How about you? Maybe that's not one for you. In our situation now, I think about with COVID, right? I think there are a lot of ways that this allows us to see certain parts of our idolatrous hearts, that COVID exposes things about us in a variety of ways. Let me suggest a couple of COVID idols. And first one I will say is the idol of the self. The idol of the self. It's all about me. Some argue that Nebuchadnezzar's statue was a statue of himself. That that was an image of himself. Now we don't know that for sure. It could be. But we often build idols of ourselves. In this time of COVID, I can understand entirely people wrestling with the advisability of public policy, of issues of government overreach, of questioning conventional wisdom. I can understand why people are frustrated, why they're exhausted, because I am both. I can understand questioning the societal risk calibration. I think maybe we've got it a little off. I don't know. I get all of that. But what I don't get is what I sometimes have witnessed, and I have witnessed it, this the rank cruelty, meanness, thoughtlessness of many who claim the name of Christ. The way they treat and speak to one another, particularly those with whom they disagree. Just cruelty, belligerence. That has been the most shocking thing and the most challenging thing to my faith in many ways, to see that happen. That behavior does not come from serving God. That comes from serving ourselves. Making myself the most important thing. I was reading an article um, by David Brooks in the New York Times. He wrote an opinion piece about evangelicalism and you know, trying to, to, to save it. And, and he was talking about this very problem of this anger, this vitriol, this way we are pummeling one another in the church. Christians doing this to other Christians. And he cites that hymn, the one we sing many times. And you will know you're, they are Christians by your love. How are we doing on that one? Sometimes in this time, we've seen that sense of worship of self through that anger and that vitriol. It's okay to disagree and have different views. It's not okay to tear people down and to be just plain old mean. Jan Hatmaker, in an article relevant, she read an article entitled, titled, We Have to Learn How to Hold Tension with Kindness. She writes this, We can disagree and yet honor one another. We can make opposite choices and yet hold on as brothers and sisters. We can experience tension and remain in community. Yes. And then she cites the example of John Wesley and Charles Spurgeon. Now, if you know anything about those two people, you will know that Charles Spurgeon was an ardent Calvinist. And John Wesley, of course, was an ardent Arminian. They were theologically miles apart. They were arch enemies in that sense. They fervently disagreed with one another and one another's theology. I mean, they were like Fauci and Rand Paul, okay? <laughs> these, these people did not get along. But Spurgeon said this about Wesley, I can only say concerning him that while I detest many of the doctrines which he preached, yet for the man himself, I have a reverence second to no Wesleyan. And if there were wanted two apostles to be added to the number of the twelve, I do not believe there could be found two men more fit to be so added than George Whitfield and John Wesley. The character of John Wesley stands beyond all imputation of self -sac for self-sacrifice, zeal, holiness, communion with God. He lived far above the ordinary level of common Christians and was one of whom the world was not worthy. That's how he spoke of the one with whom he vehemently disagreed. Why can't we do that? 
And I should say many have done that. I don't want to say that no one has. There's people in this church who disagree with a lot of things that have happened, and they've worked through with patience and with love and with endurance and, and working with those who disagree. But sometimes I've seen this thing about just this anger and meanness. And I think that's the worshiping of oneself, of honoring oneself rather than the other. What is your statue? Now let me deal with another COVID idol, if you will, uh, a second idol, and let me poke in a different area here, and this is the second COVID idol. If the first one was the idol of the self, the second one is the idol of the self. You say, you just did that one. Well, let me give you another side of the coin. There's also a risk, I think, during this pandemic to idolize ourselves in the sense of the most important thing in the world. My ultimate concern is me, my self-preservation, my life. That's all that matters. And this is particularly something that is a concern when we look at the income inequality in our society and the divides between the working class and the educated class. And what's going on in cities and other places? Sometimes we use that argument, well, I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to protect other people, when really, maybe if you press it a little bit deeper, we're trying to protect ourselves. And maybe to the harm of other people. I know it's somewhat anathema to ask you to think that way, but we should think about that. Michelle Caruso Cabrera wrote an opinion piece about what's going on in New York City about people should go back to work, go back to Manhattan. And her point was drawing this, this disparity between the unemployment level in the Bronx, where it's 11%, right? Three times the national average. Why? Because people who work in Midtown Manhattan are all at home on their laptops. They're not getting their shoes shine. They're not getting their coffee poured. They're not buying lunches. And a lot of people are hurting. And the question is, what's going on? And is that right? And is it all about helping others or is it about helping me, the laptop class versus the working class and what's going on? And I think we should ask those questions. They're legitimate questions to ask of ourselves and our choices. Is it really about my concern for others or is it all about me? This text calls us to ask questions of ourselves, to challenge ourselves. Where is the idol in my life? What is my statue? The, this text teaches us about the insidious nature of idolatry. It's in all of our lives. We are, as Calvin said, forgers of idols. The second thing we learn from this text is what it means to be a true biblical hero. A true biblical hero. I showed you that text earlier from Daniel 3.17 and that whole question of translation and whether are these guys doubting? You know, are they concerned whether God is going to deliver them or not? What's going on here? And I think they were. I think they had a level of uncertainty and a level of doubt and, dare I say it, a level of fear. You see, sometimes we think that a biblical hero is one who is absent of doubt, absent of fear, and you even have that mantra that God has gone around, right? Faith versus fear. I don't know how many times I've heard it. As if that's the dichotomy, as if they are mutually exclusive terms. Here is a group of men who I think had both. And they held them in tension. Faith and fear. Where there is no fear, there can be no courage. That's what a true biblical hero is like. One who in the midst of fear does the courageous right thing, even if they're not sure whether God's going to bail them out of the deal. That's what these three friends showed here. And beloved, my heroes, and I see this all the time, it's one of the privileges of being a pastor. My heroes are those people in this congregation who are dealing with pain, who are dealing with illness, who are dealing with battles with cancer. And what I see them as heroes is how they hold together in the tension of that moment of pain and of fear and of doubt and uncertainty, whether God might deliver them, they still hold on to their faith. 
and they follow Jesus Christ. And they do the right thing, even though they're not sure whether God is willing or able to deliver them. Those are biblical heroes. And this text teaches us about the true nature of a biblical hero. And then third and finally this morning, and most importantly, we learn that we are not alone in the fire. That we are never alone in the fire. You know what the text says. When they were in that furnace, there was that fourth man that was identified. There were three that went in, but yet there's a fourth man in the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar wonders who it is. It's a person who has the appearance as a god. It's described as an angel in the text. And much ink has been spilt over, you know, is this a Christophany? Is this Jesus? And I don't know for sure. The text doesn't indicate uh, clearly that way, but what it does indicate clearly is that this is representative of the presence of God. God was with them in the fire. He was with them in their trial. He was with them and delivered them. And you could even argue from this text that God is particularly with us in the places that are most God-forsaken. That it's in the trial, that it's in the fiery furnace, that God is most present and most made real, as he was here in this text. And Nebuchadnezzar asked that question, who is a God that will deliver you out of my hands? It's kind of mockery question. I'm going to put you into this crucible, into this fire. Who can deliver you? It reminds me of the questions that were asked of Jesus, the mockery on the cross. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. God delivered them out of the furnace, and God delivered Jesus out of the grave and from the cross. It was in that fiery furnace on that cursed cross that God revealed that he's with his people even in seemingly God-forsaken places. That's your hope and my hope. That comfort is for you this morning. If you are there, if you are in that trial, know that there is the fourth man. Know that God is with you in the fire. Prophet Isaiah said, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flames shall not consume you, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let that comfort you. God is often most manifest, most real, and the most God-forsaken places, the seemingly most God-forsaken places. Let that comfort you. And let it also challenge us this morning. Challenge us to be the fourth man, to be the light of the world. To be God's presence in God-forsaken places. Isn't that our calling as the church? Bono of U2 put it this way. God is in the slums, in the cardboard boxes with a poor playhouse. God is in the silence of a mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives. And God is with us if we are with them. We are there. If we are willing to go into the God-forsaken places and be the presence of the Lord. Ronald Pierce put it this way in his commentary. Remember the profound truth that God is most often discernible, knowable, and touchable when we join him in working in the most difficult, impossible, and allegedly God-forsaken places and lives. The third and most important thing we learn from this is that we are never alone in the fire. Beloved, make no mistake, our God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. Remember idolatry and fire. 
but he is also the God who is with us in the fire, the God who delivers us. So what do we do? We worship the God who delivers. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word this morning, for this reminder, for this challenge, for this comfort for our lives. We pray that you would help us, O oh God, to be honest with ourselves, that you, O oh Holy Spirit, will work where I can't work. I can only generalize application, but help us, Lord, each one of us, work in our lives. Show us what we're bowing down to. Help us to refrain from bowing down to the statues, the idols in our lives, and help us to live, Lord, to live for you faithfully. Even in the midst of fear and uncertainty and doubt, let us live for you faithfully. And, O oh God, let us not forget that you are with us in the fire, in the God-forsaken places, and you have called us, your church, to be like you and to be with others in those places. Hear our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would respond this morning in song number 432 in our hymnals, Our God is our refuge and our strength, if you would please rise for the singing of that hymn.
The Lord's table is a table to which we are invited by Christ himself, the one who describes himself as the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, Jesus says, will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He invites us, particularly those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He invites us to this table. He invites those who are weary and heavy laden to this table. Those who are heavy laden by this world, by their sin, by their struggles, who are just tired. He says, here you will find rest for your souls. So I invite you, on behalf of Christ, to this table. And as we come to this table, like Christ, we give thanks. Would you join me in a responsive Great Thanksgiving this morning. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Eternal God, holy and mighty, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise and to worship you in every place where your glory resides. Would you now bow your heads and pray with me? Almighty God, we come to you this morning admitting our own unworthiness to partake of this meal, and yet with confidence, sincerity, truth, and joy, we come to this supper, to this table, to this blood and this bread, to our Lord and to our Savior. We praise you for your mercy and grace, and ask you through this bread and cup, to commune with us now as we commune with you and with one another. Amen. The table of the Lord is a special place, and the church has always regarded it as special. It is a place for those who have acknowledged Jesus Christ, confessed that truth with their mouth, followed in faithfulness through baptism, and joined or connected themselves through membership or through consistent attendance at a church of Jesus Christ. If that's you, this table is for you. If that's not you, I welcome and invite you into that relationship with Christ and his church and his sacraments. They are signs and seals of his promises given to those who believe. And if you believe and you embrace those, come to this table. But if you don't, don't. Wait, wait until you have embraced the good news of Jesus Christ. And even those who've embraced those truths, we come here with hearts that acknowledge that we are sinners. We come here with a heart of reflection, self-examination. So let us give a few moments in silence to prepare our hearts and our minds to receive from the Lord these gifts. O oh God, forgive us of our sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me in the affirmation of our faith this morning? Great is the mystery of faith. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. According to his commandment, Christ is the bread of life.
Let us proclaim that death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. On the night upon which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And If you have your elements, please now prepare your bread. He took this bread and he gave thanks and then he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so too this morning we do this in remembrance of him. So beloved, take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Let us partake together. In the same manner, and on the same night, Jesus, after supper, took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we, his disciples, do the same this morning. We take, we drink, we remember, and we believe that the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Let us drink together. Join your hearts with mine as I offer a prayer of thanksgiving. O oh, loving God, you have given us a share in the one bread and the one cup and made us one with Christ. Help us to bring your salvation and your joy to all the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please now rise as we join in this morning as our prayer of the people of God, the Lord's Prayer, how Jesus taught us to pray, let us pray together in unison. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. It's now time for the offertory. Our offertory scripture is from James chapter 1 verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Our undesignated cash offerings this week will go to CES, and next week's undesignated cash collection will go to General Ministry. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we give thanks for all of the ways that you have blessed us in grace and in sustenance. Please accept our offerings as we seek to honor your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, I'd like to introduce Kate Munsinger. She is the Director of Development at the Open Door Mission, and she's going to provide us with a mission update. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. It's an honor to represent Open Door Mission. My name is Kate Munzinger and I'm the Director of Development. I know that probably you're all familiar with the mission, um, but in case you're not, we are a Christian-based rescue mission who has been addressing the needs of homelessness and food insecurity in the Rochester community since 1952. This will be our 70th year um, of service to the community in 2022. To give you a quick snapshot of 2021, we served 70, 000, a little over 70,000 meals, um, collected 289,000 uh, pounds of clothes, and distributed 315,000 pounds of food um, to local pantries. The COVID pandemic uh, has made us busier than ever. We have experienced much of what other organizations have faced with some staffing shortages and positive COVID cases among our guests and residents and our staff. 
but we have successfully managed through it all, and I'm very proud to tell you that we have maintained full service throughout the pandemic. We have three main programs, our shelter, addiction, and a food program, addiction recovery, I'm sorry, and a food program. We operate that Samaritan uh, House on Main Street in the city of Rochester, our cold uh, water women and children shelter in the town of Gates, and our caring center on Plymouth Avenue in the city. Um, and we are soon to be opening a new facility, which will be um, on Main Street as well, and permanent supportive housing. I'm gonna to try to give you a really quick uh, update on each program. Um, with COVID ongoing and the closing of the Civic uh, Center garage uh, to our homeless pop population, our Samaritan House Crisis Center has been operating at capacity. Um, in partnership with Monroe County, our shelter has served as a warming center. Um, this is basically means that we're open 24 hours a day to people who wanna come in uh, from the elements. We act as a warming center from November to March. Um, we have 50 beds at our shelter, but when we pull out cots, we can accommodate up to 70 people. Our cold water women and children's home continued to thrive in 2021 and was instrumental in getting moms and their children back on their feet. In 2021, we housed 37 families, uh, nine of which had carried over from 2020. Uh, this included a total of 39 children. Um, since opening 106 families, we opened in 2018, and since opening 106 families have stayed at cold water. Um, on average, a woman, a woman and their children will stay approximately three months in our program. Uh, throughout the year, they'll attend different classes on behavioral health, addiction recovery, resume building, job readiness, uh, Bible study, and when a mom and her family are ready to move from cold water, uh, we'll provide whatever assistance we can to make sure that she has sustained, sustained success, and that could include furniture or household goods, security deposits, um, and whatever other person center services um, they might need. In 2021, Open Door Missions phased addiction recovery program served a total of 31 students. Our residential program is located in our caring center on uh, Plymouth Ave. And we have offer uh, many services there, um, a 60 day stability program, discipleship, comprehensive case management, um, different life skills and an eight to 12 month um, residential program. 2021 also brought some very exciting news for us at Open Door Mission. We embarked on a new endeavor, um, which will be affordable housing. In October, we broke ground on renovations to our Miller building, which is off, also on Main Street. It's not directly next door to our um, Samaritan house, but about one door over. We've owned the building for many years and used it as storage. And for those who are longtime Rochester residents, uh, it used to be Archie's department store a long time ago. We're gonna, uh, we are in the process of transforming the building um, and it will offer 13 studio apartments and 11 one bedroom apartments. The project was made possible through um, a $6 million grant from the New York State Homeless Housing and Assistance Program. Um, the apartments will offer affordable housing to individuals who have been enduring chronic homelessness. Once completed, uh, Open Door Mission will provide on-site support services for residents, including case management, job readiness training, financial management skills, um, and job search assistance. And we anticipate that this project will be complete this fall. So we have been very busy in 2021 and we have much to look forward to in 2022. And I just wanna end my comments here today by saying thank you to everyone. Um, our operation and organization survives and thrives with the support of the community and others. Um, and we have appreciated your support and your faith in what we do. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. And we all please stand now and join in singing hymn number 950, Go Now in Peace.
And as you go now in peace, you go with the Lord's blessing. Receive God's blessing this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.